Welcome to part two of the four-part series on the end of time. This one is called The Sealing. We're going to see what happens with God's people during the time of the end or the time appointed, as we saw in the first presentation, of how God's people get ready and what happens during that time period and how God's people are sealed. Let's take a look at what it says about the sealing process. And let's start in the Day of Atonement because that's the time period that we are living in right now. In the typical service of the Day of Atonement, only those who had come before God with confession and repentance, those two things, and whose sins through the blood of the sin offering were transferred to the sanctuary, had a part in the service of the Day of Atonement. Only those who had gone before God and confessed their sins and repented and by the sin offering, or the lambs that were slain, those sins were then transferred to the sanctuary, from the lamb to the sanctuary. Only those people had a part in the service on the Day of Atonement. So in the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and takes place at a later period. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin of us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? This is found in 1 Peter 4.17. So we see that the judgment of the living is actually the judgment of the professed people of God. And this begins when the national Sunday law is universally enforced. The judgment of the wicked then happens at a separate and later time. In Isaiah 2.19, it says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of His majesty, when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So how does this fit in with the sealing? It's called the shaking time. So at the time that the judgment is happening, there will also be a shaking out it's the separation of the wheat and the, and the chaff. Um, it's the separation of the good and the evil that are combined together. All those who are good will be standing for truth. All those who are uh, wanting to, to remain evil and not acknowledge God as their Savior and be loyal to Him will be shaken out. How is this going to happen? It says in Testimonies, Volume 7, that the substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority, remember it's all about authority, of who you will serve, the exaltation of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal Himself. He will arise in His majesty to shake terribly the earth. So when this substitution becomes universal, becomes enforced universally throughout the whole planet, that's when the shaking will begin. He will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity, and the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In Testimonies, Volume 1, she describes what she saw in vision. She says, I was shown the people of God and saw them mightily shaken. Some, with strong faith and agonizing cries, were pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. So what does that mean? The meaning of the shaking is caused by the direct or straight or undiluted speaking and testimony by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. So who is the true witness? It's Jesus Christ is the true witness. And the counsel of Him is to the Laodiceans. We are living in a Laodicean state. If you read in Revelation, it talks about the churches. And the last church uh, is called the Laodicean church. They are lukewarm. And this straight testimony is causing a shaking, a division out, so that those who 
have a love of the truth will stay in, and those who do not have a love of the truth will be uh, deceived by the strong delusion that is coming upon the earth. So this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not, not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking among God's people. The testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance, and all that truly receive it will obey it and be purified. So we see that there must be deep repentance during this shaking time. It cannot, it, up to this point, she says, it's been lightly esteemed. The church hangs in the balance here, the destiny of the church. All those who truly receive it will obey it and be purified because the truth has a purifying effect. If we obey the truth, then the truth will cleanse us. It, we will stop sinning because we will be obeying the truth. In the spirit of prophecy, she was shown a vision. She was shown a vision of the church in the last days, and as the church was shaken out, they became looked upon as a company. This company represents a smaller portion of the church. And so in this vision, she was watching these people walking up this straight path, and there were certain things that were happening. She noticed as they went along that the numbers of this company started decreasing. It had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. And the careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness. But their numbers were immediately made up by others taking hold of the truth and coming back into the ranks. Still the evil angels pressed around them in her vision, but they could have no power over them. The truth alone was exalted to them. It was dearer and more precious than life. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. And so I asked, she says, what had made this great change? An angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. All who wish to draw off from the body will have opportunity. Something will arise to test everyone. We are all going to be tested in this shaking time period. The great sifting time is just before us, and the jealous and the fault-finding who are watching for evil will be shaken out. They hate reproof, and they despise correction. So this ordeal of the sifting time goes as follows. Satan will work his miracles to deceive, and he will set up his power as supreme. So we see that happening in the world today. Uh, the governments are asking us to obey their authority. And the church may appear as about to fall, but it will not fall. It does not fall. It remains. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. So the sinners in the church will be sifted out during this time period. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a very terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. This, here we see, is the sifting time, and it is also the preparation of the 144,000. During this shaking time, the remnant that purify their souls by obeying the truth actually gather strength from the trying process. This is kind of interesting. So as they go through this, this testing process, this shifting, uh, all of the crises that are happening and proving their resolve, 
will actually gather strength from this. So this is not something that we have to fear. They will be exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. So while, while the world who are in the church at that time are actually in apostasy and being sifted out, the remnant people will be purifying their souls by, by obeying the truth. And they will be gathering strength from this trying process. So when is this shaking time? We see the shaking time portrayed in Daniel 11.35. And in Daniel 11.35 it says, And some of them of understanding shall fall, to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Let's just kind of break that apart a little bit. It says, the first sentence says, And some of them of understanding shall fall. Uh, this is indicative of bright lights going out. In other words, pastors and leaders who have been bright in preaching the truth for years, it's saying they will defect, they will apostatize. To try them, God's people will be tried as metal is refined or gold is refined in the fire. And to purge them with hyssop is found in Psalms 51.7, purge. And to make them white, or the blotting out of sins, is found in Isaiah 1.18. Even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. The time appointed, we just learned in the first presentation, is found in Daniel 12.7. as the 1260 literal days yet to transpire. So let's look at these verses. In Psalm 17.3, it says, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, Thou hast tried me, there's that word try, trying me, or testing, and shalt find nothing, because I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. I have made the resolve in my heart that I will not speak any lies, I will not speak any deceit, I will not transgress God's government or His law in any way, shape, or form. I will be loyal to Him. Psalms 51, 7 says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Isaiah 1, 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, or red, or stained, they show that we have transgressed God's law. We're, we're, we're rebels. We have broken the laws of God. We have rebelled against Him. So those actions show up as blots and stains on our character. But they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. White as wool. This is the transformation that God is going to perform in those who confess their sins and repent. Let's get a second witness on this. In Ephesians 4.30 it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Well, there's talking about the Holy Spirit or the refreshing of our souls by the Spirit of God. It's by the Holy Spirit that we are then sealed. The Holy Spirit fills our hearts and our minds. All of the inclinations to do evil are, are banned and we are actually sealed at the day of redemption or during the time appointed, which is yet to come, which we learned in the first presentation. Now let's talk about the sealing process. It's actually described in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3 going forward. It says, And the glory of God, of the God of Israel, was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. So let's pause here for just a second, and let's see what this word cherub means we can compare that with a verse in Exodus 25, 22, because it describes what a cherub or a cherubim is. It says in Exodus 25, 22, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So these two cherubims are the two angels which are upon the Ark of the Testimony 
in the most holy place of the sanctuary. This was in the sanctuary when the children were in the wilderness. So when it says that, and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, is talking about the glory of God was gone up from the angel or the ark. So referring back to Ezekiel 9.3, she says, Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary. That's what that verse was telling us. To put on garments of vengeance and to pour out his wrath in judgments upon those who have not responded to the light God has given them. Five Testimonies 207. She further uh, says that, And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So again, referring to the same Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to, uh, and 3 to 6, she says, The work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people, the false watchmen. So this work of destruction begins with the ones who are leading the church if they are in apostasy. So the false watchmen are the first to fall. There are none to pity or spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. That's a sad statement, but it's because they have resolved in their heart not to follow God, but to rebel and to be completely wicked. In Maranatha, page 242, she says, the sealing time is very short, this sealing process, and will soon be over. Now is the time while the four angels are holding the four winds to make our calling and election sure. Four angels represent the four quadrants of the earth, meaning north, west, east, and south. And the four winds are winds of strife. So God is holding back through these angels all of the strifes from all around the earth from actually happening. I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had accomplished their work and were prepared for the trying hour before them. So this is the picture that we're, that we're seeing here. The sealing time is very short. The third angel's message is now closing. The power of God is resting upon his people and they had accomplished their work. They had received the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord and the living testimony had been revived. The last great warning had sounded everywhere and it had stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of the earth who would not receive the message. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus so that his work was done. And the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 7 because we see some of the components actually listed here. It says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So just before we entered it, the time of trouble, she says, we all received the seal of the living God. Then I saw the four angels cease to hold the four winds. That means that the strife, the winds of strife, will then be allowed to blow on the entire planet after God's people 
receive the seal of the living God. And I saw famine, I saw pestilence and sword, nation rose against nation, and the whole world was in confusion. So who's going to receive this test is the next question. The test is the sunny law versus the Sabbath. It's when the sunny law is placed in effect and enforced. She says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. So all of God's people must go through this test, this trial of whom will they serve. Will they serve God by resting on the seventh day? In other words, showing their obedience to God by resting on the seventh day? Or will they give in to the sunny law and the demands of the world and the papacy to submit to their authority? Whose authority are you going to follow? All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. So if you yield the truth that you know is there, that's from heaven, the truth that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and accept the Sunday as Sabbath for whatever reason. It might be that you believe in it. It might be that you don't believe in it, but in order to work, I'm going to go along with it. I give my hand to it. Either way, a person will receive the mark of the beast. God wants us not to receive the mark of the beast and receive the plagues that we poured out as a result. God wants us to be saved so he's asking us to be loyal to him and worship on the seventh day and demonstrate that loyalty. So this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. She goes on to say, what need will there be of this solemn warning not to receive the mark of the beast when all of the saints of God are sealed and ticketed for the new Jerusalem? If we did not have to go through this test, why would there be a warning not to receive the mark of the beast? She says, O oh, consistency, thou art a jewel. We must be consistent here. This test is for God's people. So how does it work? This is a very key point, and I, I really want you to pay attention and, and watch closely, and listen closely. She says, The mighty power of the Holy Spirit works an entire transformation in the character of the human agent. So the Holy Spirit will work an entire transformation, not just a partial one. You will be transformed entirely to be able to live with holy and perfect beings that exist in heaven and on, and on other worlds in the universe. This transformation will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, a completely new creature. When a man is filled with the Spirit, the more severely he is tested and tried. So when you are filled with the Spirit, Expect the trials and the tribulation and the testing to occur. This is what has to happen. Because as you are tried, the more clearly you will prove that you are a representative of Christ. The peace that dwells in the soul is seen on the countenance. So you will have peace in your heart. The words and actions express the love of the Savior. There is no striving for the highest place Self is renounced, and the name of Jesus is written on all that is said and done. We may talk of the blessings of the Holy Spirit, but unless we prepare ourselves for its reception, of what avail are our works? So we must talk the walk, or walk the talk, as they say, if we are to have and experience the blessings of the Holy Spirit. Um, we've got to prepare ourselves to receive the Holy Spirit. Are we striving with all our power to attain to the stature of men and women in Christ? Are we seeking for His fullness, ever pressing towards the mark set before us, which is the perfection of His character? Your character, my character. Are we pressing towards that mark to have 
perfection of character. When the Lord's people reach this mark, this perfection of character, they will be sealed in their foreheads. Filled with the Spirit, they will be complete in Christ, and the recording angel will declare, It is finished. This is how it works. During this process, Satan will attack and try to stop it. In the Spirit of Prophecy, she writes, I saw Satan would work more powerfully now than ever he has before. He knows that his time is short and that the sealing of the saints will place them beyond his power. He will now work in every way that he can and will try his every insinuation to get the saints off from their guard and get them asleep on the present truth or doubting it so as to prevent their being sealed with the seal of the living God. Oh, dear friends, I pray that we will not be distracted, that we will not be asleep of this process. We cannot doubt the present truth that is before us in God's word. We must believe it. We must have the faith as a little child. Those who give in to this process, those who give in at any time, will be weighed in the balance and they will be found wanting. They are immediately given the mark of the beast and there is no second chance. There is no changing their minds. The sealing is occurring. The, the mark of the beast will be given. There is going to be a death decree coming up. We have read in the Bible that during the, the time of Esther, Haman built gallows for Mordecai. But how that story ends is that Mordecai, uh, Haman actually was hung on the same gallows that he built for Mordecai. And so the same death decree that is meant for the saints will be realized by the wicked. There's going to be a death decree. And it will go forth against the people of God and will be very similar to that that was issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. So now, as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. We are not going to be sheltered or shielded from these crises. Uh, we have examples of the, this in the stories in, in the Bible. We will go through the crisis just as Noah was saved through the flood and not from it. And just as Daniel was saved through the lion's den, but not from it. And just as the three Hebrews were saved through the fiery furnace, but not from it, the Hebrews at the time of Esther will, had to go through the death decree. They were not saved from it. But they were the victorious ones. They're the ones who survived. They're the ones that came out clean. The judgment and the sitting process occurs as follows. There are two groups of the judgment. The dead people of God are currently being judged. That started in 1844 with the start of Jesus moving into the most holy place to review the books to see who the professed people of God could be saved, who truly were loyal to him. The second portion of this group are the living people of God who are yet to be judged. The living people of God will be judged when the Sunday law is passed and enforced worldwide. The living professed people of God are divided into three groups. Those who receive the mark of the beast, which would be indicative uh, or symbolic of the five foolish virgins. Remember the ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. The five foolish virgins receive the mark of the beast, even though they profess to be the people of God. They are weighed in the balance and found wanting. The second group of the professed people of God may die in Christ during the loud cry. They will be martyrs. The third group will be those who receive the seal of the living God are represented by the 144,000. So let's look graphically at this sifting and shaking time. There's a time period here as indicated by these two goalposts. The time appointed is between these two goalposts. It's the 1260 literal days. And at the right, we see that just before the 1260 days are over, the seven last plagues will begin. Well, why is there an overlap there? During the sifting and shaking time, we see that it starts with the passing of the Sunday law. And the three angels' messages 
are then proclaimed, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of judgment has come. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And the third message, do not receive the mark of the beast, lest you receive of her plagues. And at the end of this time is the close of probation, when Jesus Christ says it is done. Prior to that time, there will be what's called the little time of trouble, where we will start experiencing a lot of crises. They will get harder and more difficult. There will be more demands placed upon us. We will be banned and banished and not allowed to buy and sell. There will be hardships upon us. What are we going to do when we can't go to the store anymore? We can't buy food. We've got to grow food in our own gardens. So this is a little time of trouble what we, that we will experience. Just before the close of probation, the refreshing of the latter rain we just saw will be poured out upon God's people who are obeying the truth and purifying their souls. Then there will be a death decree uh, looming in the horizon. And finally, we see that the saints are sealed just before the close of probation. Probation closes when every single person has made their choice either for or against God. Finally, after the close of probation is when the four angels release the four winds and the destroying angel starts destroying, beginning at my sanctuary, as it says, beginning with the false watchmen, the false pastors and leaders who have been leading the whole world and all of the members of the churches astray and saying peace and safety. God's people are, are, are going through this trying time, but their sins will be purged, they will be made white as snow, and it will be done even to the time of the end or the time appointed. So in conclusion, starting in 1844, Jesus entered the most holy place to begin investigating professed people of God who are resting in the grave. This investigative judgment is when only those who profess to be followers of Christ will be evaluated to determine if they have confessed all their sins so that they can be blotted out. Because this is the actual action that's happening. Jesus is looking through the books, the history books of their life to see if they have confessed them all so that he can blot them out. The people who will not be investigated during this time are the worldly people that would be comprised of, say, atheists, heathen people who have nothing to do with God, they're left out. They are not investigated. When legislation is passed, making void the fourth commandment, Jesus will begin investigating the living who profess to be followers of God. This would be you and I. The fourth commandment describes the Sabbath, the seventh day, as the day of rest. When they make this void, they pass laws that all of the countries of the world rebel completely against God, this is when this investigative judgment for the living begins. This is also the shaking time or the sifting time of the living. It is the time appointed to determine and make up the kingdom of God. God's people will be tried or tested, purged or purified, and their sins blotted out, even to the time of the end. This sifting or testing time will continue until the ultimate test comes to see if they will give in. Only at the close of probation, because of the coming death decree showing they are willing, willing to die rather than receive the mark of the beast, will God finally say, enough, and he will seal them. All will be numbered and sealed about the same time. 1 Peter 4.17, in conclusion, means the professed people of God will be judged first, and then, a thousand years later, will be the wicked. So this, this time of judgment is not for the wicked that's coming up when the Sunday law is passed. It's for the professed people of God. Ezekiel 9 means to place a mark or seal on the living followers of God who will not succumb to the mark of the beast. Then, after the close of probation, Slay the rest and begin with the false watchmen, the dumb dogs who refuse to bark. At the time appointed, when Satan's permanent uh, government of force is again ruling with fierceness and cruelty, Jesus will finish making up the balance of his kingdom. This is what's happening. At the very time when Satan is grasping desperately anyone he can he's trying to destroy everyone he's trying to get everyone to sin and to follow him during this 
time of wickedness is when Jesus will finish making up pure individuals. So there's going to be a huge contrast between the wicked and the righteous. The shaking time is the time appointed when the saints will be tried and purged and made white, who will then vindicate the character of God. This will mark the end of the rule of sin in the, in the entire universe. Once this happens, there will be no more sin. Jesus will take back the scepter of rulership, the rod of iron, and ride the white horse to reclaim the earth and gather his children. What a glorious, glorious return we will see as Jesus comes to get his children. Thank you for watching this, and I pray that you are blessed.